All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. What a great day. I know we're probably expecting a little bit of rain, but that's okay. It is nice inside here. We don't have leaky ceilings. First, I do want to thank some individuals for uh, some of the painting outside. I know Larry Wellington, uh, Beth came up, Mason and Adam, um, and painted. Did I leave anybody out? No? Okay. Painted the ceiling is here in the back, and then the ceiling in the whole hallway. Did I leave somebody out? I, I did say Wellington. Yeah. No, we were all good. So uh, those guys, we had to get, Wellington, Wellington had to get a stepladder to get up to the, that was a joke. I'm teasing you. I'm just teasing. I couldn't help it. Yeah, I know. I'm going to be in trouble after church. I'll, I'll be up at the altar, Pastor. Don't worry about that. Be right up. We do have a couple things going on. Uh, so we do have a deacon's meeting uh, immediately following church. We're going to try and change some things up just a little bit on our meetings and see, see how things go. Now, very, very, very important. Does anybody know what happens tomorrow? It, well, there is a birthday, yes. We actually have, well, that is very, very important. But we do also have um, sports camp, sports and art camp. Now, here's the thing. Even if you didn't sign up, I would highly encourage you to show up. I promise you, you will be used in some way. You're not going to get abused. You're going to get used a little bit, and, and that's a good thing. You're going to have all kinds of fun um, helping, helping kids uh, learn more about Jesus. Now, we're trying a little bit differently. We're doing some sports and some art stuff and then mixing in a lot of Jesus. So that's a good thing. We can do that. So if you can, uh, starts, it's from 6.30 to 8.30. If you show up and you, you don't want to stay the whole time, that's okay. Just show up. Just show up. We'll find spots for you. Um, we got all kinds of fun that we're going to have doing that. Um, so if you can, um, I'm assuming if you are able to be here closer to 6-ish, we do have some check-in stuff, some st things going on. We have, uh, I think, is it 12 kids already registered? Yes. 12 kids that don't even go to church here registered for this, which is fantastic. We typically have several that show up and, uh, and register once they get here. So that is very, very encouraging for us. So that's good. Um, let's see, the painting went over that. We do have, uh, we did have some, some of our kids, three of our kids went to uh, church camp this past week. And uh, it is, as a church, we help support them to go, just so you guys are aware of that. Um, they are the future of this church. At times, that seems a little bit on the scary side, but they're, they're getting it all together. These girls, and Austin's not here today, but they're doing a, doing a fantastic job. I would like to bring them up. They would like to share a couple things with you guys real quick. Seven. Hello. So, as you guys know, we just got back from uh, Falls Creek Youth Camp in Davis, Oklahoma, we did learn some things. We did some Bible quizzing, and we memorized some verses of the book of James. And I think one of the most important things that the teens learned this week was how you shouldn't use the same mouth that you curse and that you speak out of. So that is really important, not even just for teens, but for, like, everybody. So, like, some verses that we learned was, like, out of the same mouth that comes praising and cursing my brothers, this should not be, and that's James 3.10. And another one was how James 2.9 was um, you shouldn't, like, no man can tame his tongue, for his rest is evil, full of deadly poison. And that was one of the main things that I took in today's week. Um, last week. Um, can you tell me? I took away a lot from Bible quizzing because that's, like, What I got from that book was that you need to actually be a good person. You need to actually be a positive person. For God and not living for ourselves when we learn that from that book. And, uh, you know, Austin's not here. I know Austin would definitely have a lot to say up here with a lot of excitement. So we'll look forward to hearing from him another day. But I'm so proud of these girls in Austin for going. Um, it is a great event. There's, is there about 10,000 kids down there? About, about roughly 10,000 kids to go to this camp. It's huge. Um, my son-in-law has been leading it uh, down there with about, a, is there 110 kids in your cabins? Yeah. Roughly about 110 kids. 
and uh, they do. It's it's inspiring. Uh, my wife always goes. She comes back dead tired, but happy. So that is a good thing. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements. Judy has a birthday on July third. So next Sunday we're going to sing Happy Birthday. And Beth and Brett do have an anniversary today. I did hear um, from Beth this morning. Asked her how many years. She says 23 fabulous years. Um, I didn't get the same response from Brett. He didn't use the word fabulous. So I'm sure he's pretty excited about everything too. But that is actually, today's the 27th. Yeah, today. Today's their anniversary. They're in Omaha uh, right now. So uh, hopefully they have a safe trip back as well. Um, Quickly for me, I just want to kind of go over something that that God's been talking to me about a little bit this week. Um, I'll never forget when I was in desert survival training in Utah. And when it's pitch dark at night, there are no lights. I mean, there is nothing. And there was one night in particular where the moon wasn't even shining, but you could see the stars. And there was literally, I mean, you can't count them. There's so many billions and billions of stars. If you've never been out in an area where it's pitch dark and you actually look up in the sky and see actually how many stars there are, Kansas City, you, you really can't. You can see a few, but anywhere close to a city, it is very difficult. For some of you country folk in the back, you, did I say that correctly? Country folk in the back, you guys know what it's like being way out there. It is, it is amazing. But it's one of those things where you, you think you're so small. You know, like looking at all this stuff and you think about yourself being, why would, you know, what am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? And the verse that came to my, came to my attention is Psalms 8, uh, verse 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Now the word mindful stuck out when it talked about that to me. Being mindful doesn't mean that, you, that God just, you know, periodically thinks about you. Being mindful means you are on his mind 24-7. And to think about being me, and all of a sudden, I'm on God's mind 24-7. I don't know if I do that, can do that in anything that I do here as a human being. I don't think we're capable of doing that. But God is mindful of me. He's mindful of you. When you think about that, it's, it's just inspiring. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for just the wonderful things that you do for us, Lord. Thank you for being mindful of us, Lord. Thank you for having us constantly on your mind and, and uh, looking out for the good um, for us, Lord, and looking out for just the things that you do for us. Lord, you, you bless us so much and so often, Lord, that a lot of times we take for granted. Please help us not to do that, Lord. Help us to just thank you and be being a thankful uh, a mindset constantly, Lord, and just, just inspired by what you do for us, Lord. Help this service today to just be a great service, Lord. We love you and appreciate you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Now, here's the cool part. We got some really good songs. <laughs> Joyce got to be here, and we're playing this morning, and, and, and these guys are singing the hearts out. She's over there swaying and clapping. We haven't even begun service yet. <laughs> so here's what I want you guys to do. If you feel inspired to sing super loud, even if you're off key, Wellington, well, uh, yeah, he's not off key. He actually sings. Uh, he sings on key. I'm just picking on him today. Just sing, <laughs> sing with your heart for Jesus today, guys. Good morning. I want to welcome you here this morning, the worship team. We've worked hard on these songs. Uh, it's different when Amy is not here, and I know that, um, but. Obviously, work sometimes does take her away from us on Sunday morning. I'd invite you to stand with us as we begin our our time of song together, our time of praise together. And I just want to read to you from Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And this is, of course, you know, the the Jewish leaders at that time were telling the the disciples that they couldn't talk about Jesus. And they had kind of imprisoned a couple of them. And they came back in to the the disciples and it says this in verse 24, chapter 4. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. This is the God we worship. And so let us this morning raise our voices in one accord. You are 
above. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Thank you.
be seated, you may. sing this last song, I just want you, I, I, I hope that you will enter into this in the same way that, that we've been entering into this as we've been singing this song and practicing it. <clears throat> the name of Jesus has power. The name of Jesus is more than just a name. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our friend. <clears throat> And so as we sing this last song, I hope that you'll sing it in the same spirit that we try to, in just a spirit of worship of our Lord and Savior.
Your glory. 
What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be talking this morning about what happens when our physical life and our spiritual life intersect, or at least how they ought to be doing that. 1 Timothy chapter 2. For most people who profess to be a Christian, there is at least an acknowledgement that sharing Jesus with other people is important, right? I mean, if you are a Christian, I think it's difficult to not admit that we are supposed to share Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we all do it. I'm not saying we all do it well. But we all pretty much say we should. I think for many Christians, the problem is life. (laughs) Life is messy. Life is complicated. Life is often hard. And we get so wrapped up in trying to live and paying the bills and being a decent human being to those around us that we forget about the other side of the coin. And that's the side where our spiritual life and our physical life intersect. See, it's easy to ignore the spiritual life. Right? Come on. It is. We can't see the spiritual life. Our physical senses are nearly useless in the spiritual realm. And since we can't sense the spiritual life like we do the physical world, it escapes our notice. The things that are important in the spiritual life are left out, and that includes being a witness for Jesus. So is there a solution? Well, of course there is. God never leaves us dangling without a solution to the issues that we face. Uh, The solution is simpler than you might think. And it's found here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy at Ephesus. Stand, if you would please, in honor of God's word. Let me read to you, starting at verse 1. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Father, as we pause here, as always, Lord, we ask you to help us to not only understand, but to help us apply what your word will tell us today. Use it, Lord, to your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I apologize. I'm a little dry-throated this morning. So I apologize if I have to take a little water here. So what did Paul say? First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Prayer. That's what Paul says. If you want to have a spiritual life and a physical life that intersect one another in a proper way, it starts with prayer. And prayer is simple. Prayer is not complicated. Prayer is talking to God. Now, for the last year or so, I don't know, Wellington, you know, as you've been attending with us and joining with us and have joined with us, Wellington has been drawing people into my office on Sunday mornings before service to pray for me. And I really appreciate that. And this morning, we we broke new ground this morning. Uh, It started off with just deacons that were invited into my office to pray. And then it was deacons and whatever other men we could find. And this morning, we, we had the first woman join us in my office to pray. Brianna was sitting in there. She was sitting in there when it was time to pray, and, and Tim looked at her and said, I, I, you know, I think we're going to have to ask you to step out right now. And I'm like, why? She can pray. She can talk to God just as well as any of us men. And so she did. 
And so prayer is that simple thing. Now, again, remember, prayer is never meant to change God's mind. Prayer is meant to change our hearts. And Paul gives four descriptors that he uses here. First, he says, I want you to give supplications before God. And that's simply lifting up urgent requests. That's telling God, you know what, God, I have this really urgent need that I have in my life. And I I need your help today. Not tomorrow, today. He said, but also you need to make sure you are lifting up those prayers too. And those are, and, and this is the one word, by the way, in all of these four descriptors that makes sure that we're talking to the right person because that word prayer there always means directed to God. So when he says, lift up these supplications and these prayers, he's saying, talk to God about what's going on in your life. You know, know, there are things that are going on in our lives that we don't want to talk to anybody else about, right? I mean, we're afraid to talk about some of the things that are going on in our lives to anybody else, but we can talk to God. And that's what Paul is saying. If you want your spiritual life and your physical life to intersect in the right way, you've got to do this. You've got to lift up these general requests, but also these specific requests, and you've got to be giving them to God. And then he says, but, but don't just be selfish and pray for yourself. He says, you've got to lift up intercessions as well, and that's on behalf of others. So as I'm praying to God and I'm talking about my own specific life and the needs I have and those urgent needs and those general needs and I'm directing them all at God, I ought to also then stop and say, you know what? I remember there's some others out there that are hurting as well. I remember there are some others out there that that need your touch, Lord. And so I'm going to lift them up to you as well. You know, we have have a a new sound booth crew this morning. Um, Gary and Nicole are up there in, in, the, in the booth this morning. And you know what? Sharon and I this morning, you know what we prayed for? A perfectly smooth operation. Because this is their first Sunday that they've volunteered to go up there and do this. And the last thing they need is a disaster. So we prayed for them. We interceded on their behalf. Because I know what it feels like when all of a sudden something goes wrong. And you feel like, oh my goodness, this is my fault. i got to fix this. And so... Paul says, you know what, make sure you're lifting other people up. And then fourthly, he says, be thankful in it as well. Give thanksgivings. Express your gratitude to God. Even today, express your gratitude for God, for the things that you've prayed for and you haven't even received, perhaps. Tell him you're still thankful. Now, mean it, obviously. You better be sincere in this. But this is what Paul says, first of all, He says, and I urge that you do this. I beg you to do this. I implore you. This has to be a part of your spiritual life. Supplications, prayer to God, intercessions, thanksgivings. If this is not a part of your life, you're missing the very most important thing that you can do with your spiritual life. Because prayer is the conduit. It is the means by which our physical and spiritual life intersect. That's how we get. This is where our physical and spiritual life intersects. That's how we get from point A to point B. You're never going to get there if you don't have prayer. Communication is so important, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is communicating to God. And also through that, I believe God communicates back to us. Now, communication is always important. I don't know if you know how important communication can be. Stories told of a farmer's wife who had to go into town to have a a lunch date with some of her friends. And so she put food for her husband in, in the oven, and she left him a note. Lunch in oven. When she returned about 4 o'clock that afternoon, she waved at her husband, but he didn't wave back. She thought to herself, well, he must have had a bad day. She stepped into the kitchen and she looked around and she saw that the casserole was still in the oven. It hadn't been touched. There were no dirty dishes in the sink. She couldn't understand what was going on. She looked in the refrigerator and she saw that there was a sandwich was missing. Of course, it was a sandwich she had intended to throw away. (sighs) Finally, her husband came in from his day's work. And she asked him, 
What did you have for lunch? He didn't answer. Did you get my note? Sure did. It said, lunch is over. That's when she learned she needed to really proofread her notes a little bit better. (laughs) Communication is so important, and when we don't do it well, there are going to be problems. And I don't care what relationship you're talking about. Husband, wife. Parents, children, worker, boss, us and God. If we don't communicate well to God in prayer, our relationship with God will suffer. It's the primary means that we have for communicating to our Lord. And only as we spend time in prayer will we be able to have our physical and spiritual lives intersect the way they're supposed to. So that's the general thing about prayer. That has to be a part of it. But then Paul goes on and he tells Timothy who we ought to be praying for. Right? I urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. So for who are we to pray? Well, let's take a look at this. The, the list is, is pretty wide open, actually. Uh, We ought to have a general prayer list. We ought to have a general prayer list. And here's the deal with the general prayer list. No one's off limits. No one is off limits. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. There's people out there I don't like. There's people out there that are doing things that I hate saying things that are hateful and hurtful. There are evil people in the world that are doing evil things. Are you telling me, preacher, that I'm supposed to put those people on my prayer list and pray for them? Yes. Yes, I am. The ones you don't like. The ones that you think are so evil that they're beyond the ability of anybody to reach. There is no lack of candidates for your general prayer list. No one is off limits. But then Paul goes on and he does something interesting. He says, you ought to have a specific prayer list too. And this specific prayer list needs to be for the kings and for all who are in high positions, for those in authority. And this happens every time the Leadership in our country changes. <laughs> you know, sometimes Christians, I think, are confused about this idea of politics. <clears throat> and I don't want to offend anybody here, okay? But let me just say this. God is neither a Republican nor a Democrat. And I don't care if you like who's in the White House or not. I don't care if you like who the Speaker of the House is or not. I don't care if you like them or not. I don't care if you agree with them politically or not. You ought to be praying for them. You don't like our senators? You still ought to be praying for them. You don't like our representative? Pray for them. Pray for them. There's a reason why Paul gives us this commandment. He said, you ought to pray for the kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, why would Paul be so concerned about us living a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way? Well, let's take a look at what those words mean. Peaceful simply means undisturbed. So if I want to live an undisturbed life, outward things coming at me, I need to be praying for those who are in positions of authority. Okay, that makes sense. But he also says you need to be able to live a quiet life. That's an inward focus. And, he's, and, and, and all that means is a well-ordered life, not a life of chaos. So if I get in touch with God and I say, God, look, this is what's going on. You know what's going on in my country. You know what's going on in my state. You know what's going on in my county. You know what's going on in my city. You know what's even going on in my, ho- in my homeowners association. Here's what's going on, and I want to be, I want to have 
a peaceful life, the things that are directed at me from outwardly, that they don't you know, disturb me too much, but I also want to have a, a quiet life, an orderly life, a non-chaotic life inwardly. He says, and you need this so that you can live a godly life. Our practices regarding God. You know, <clears throat> there are still countries on this planet where what we're doing here right now this morning are not only illegal, it is potentially a death sentence to anybody who would attend it. And yet there are still groups gathering in those countries doing the exact same thing we've done, singing praises to God, praying to God, hearing the word of God. You see, Paul says, regardless of who the leaders are, you need to be praying for them so that you can do this. Now remember, when Paul wrote this, do you know who the king of Rome was, the emperor of Rome at this time? He's one of those good guys by the name of Nero. Oh, wait a minute, that wasn't a good guy, was it? <laughs> Nero was about an evil, uh, an emperor of Rome, as you can imagine. And Paul's telling Timothy, you need to pray for the king. About as evil a man as you could come across. And Paul says, pray for him. So that you can have this peaceful, quiet life that allows you to live a godly life. But also, he says, uh, that you might live a dignified life. And that we're dignified really talks about our, how we direct our life toward people. In, in this sense, that we might be able to be honest, that we might be able to be good people in front of our neighbors. Now, this is what Paul says. This is what you're supposed to be praying for the... To, you know, that you've got your general list, all the people that you need to be praying for. No one off limits on that. And remember, it's supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings. But then you've also got your specific list where you ought to be praying for the leaders, for those who rule over us, so that we can live this type of life. Now, does this mean that if I pray for these things, that the government isn't going to come and try and shut me down someday? No. Remember, this is not to change God's mind, it's to change my heart. And I think some of it, especially in those countries where it's already illegal, they need to be praying for their leaders so that they continue to have the courage to do what they're doing. But here's the thing, as I said, Paul was telling Timothy this when Nero was the emperor, one of the most evil men that possibly has ever lived. It's so easy to live as a Pharisee. You get that? It's so easy to live as a Pharisee. To look at our rulers, our leaders, our governors, our senators, our representatives, and declare ourselves to be so much better to, than they are. Because we have different views than they do. Judging others by our own standards of right and wrong instead of living a peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified life and letting that shine so that even those who don't know Jesus will respect our lifestyle. You don't really have to pay close attention in this passage. You know, Paul says, first of all, I urge you, Lift up supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving for the kings and for those who are in authority for all people. And where in that passage does Paul say, and by the way, before you sit down to pray for them, make sure you sit in judgment on them. Let me look at it again. Maybe I missed it. First of all, then I... No, sorry. It's not there. We're not called to sit in judgment upon people even upon our higher authorities, we're called to pray for them. And remember, the prayer is not meant to change God's mind, it's meant to change our heart. Because my fear is, and I know it's, and again, I know you guys are much better at this than I am, okay? <clears throat> but for me, if I don't pray for them in this way, 
my heart's going to get hard toward them. And I'm going to start dismissing them. And when the opportunity comes perhaps to share Jesus, I'm not going to. Because why would I? Our prayers are meant to soften our hearts toward those who need Jesus, not force some change upon them so we can share Jesus. Now let me give you the motivation for it. The why. Why does God want us to do this? Verses three through six. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Oh. How many of you, and, and, and you don't need to raise your hands, okay, because I, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, but how many of you every day wake up and say, today I want to please God more than myself? <laughs> I'm holding my own hand down, okay? I mean, I'd love to be able to stand up here and go, every day, man, I wake up and that's the first thing out of my mouth is, Lord, today I want to please you more than myself. No, so, I got to work on that, okay? But Paul tells Timothy, here's a way you can please God. He says, this is good. To do these things is good. To pray for those who are in authority over you. To pray for all those. No one off limits. This is good. This is useful. This is beneficial. This will help. And he says, oh, by the way, it's also pleasing to God, which means God gladly accepts it. And then he goes in and he talks a little about, it, about the heart of God. It is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Have you ever thought about what God desires? What he wants? Here it is. What God desires, what he wants. All people to be saved. Now we know that's not going to happen because some are going to reject him. But here's the even worse side of that. Not that some will reject. It's that some won't hear. And some won't hear because we don't tell. Some won't hear about Jesus because we won't tell. To me, that's far worse than some will reject after hearing. What God desires is salvation for all. Now, there are those out there who try to parse the language here a little bit, who try to say that all doesn't really mean all. And I've, I've tried to get on board with this, okay? I've really tried to work this through in my own mind, how all cannot mean all. But every time I start looking at the word all, I come back to the very simple meaning, all means all, and that's all that all means. So who does God desire, who does God want to go to hell? Nobody. Absolutely nobody. What God desires is that they would come to know who Jesus is. And then Paul reminds Timothy, he says, and oh, by the way, remember this, remind the people in your churches of this, there is one God. One, that's it. There aren't multiple gods. There is one God. And remind them also of this, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one path to know that one God, and that is Jesus Christ. You're not going to get there by studying Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, Islam. Sorry, you're not going to get there. You're not going to find the one true God 
through those other paths because the only path to knowing God is the one mediator that God has provided, the man Christ Jesus. And you either know him as your Lord and Savior or you're on the wrong path. You know, pleasing my earthly father was simple. I mean, it really was. Pleasing my dad was relatively simple. Work hard, be honest so our family wasn't shamed, and do my best. That's all I had to do. And mostly I wanted to please my dad. I didn't always live up to his standards, but I wanted to try. If I wanted to try and please my earthly parents, why wouldn't I want to please my Heavenly Father, my Creator, my Savior, my God, when Paul tells us how to do it. So let me bring this to a close this morning. Paul concludes this little section here with verse 7. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. <clears throat> now, admittedly, there's one thing you have to understand. I am not an apostle. Okay? I do not hold an apostolic office. I know there are those out there that believe that people still hold apostolic offices today. Um, I, I'm not going to debate that with them. I'm just saying I know I'm not an apostle. But I am a preacher. I may always, not always be the best preacher. But I am one whom God has told to proclaim the truth of the gospel, which is what a preacher is. And I would argue that so are you. He said, no, wait a minute, I've not been called to preach. Yes, you have. You may not have been called to preach from a pulpit, but you've been called to preach. Every day that you walk this earth, knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're called to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to those you come in contact with. You have been called to follow what Paul has directed here. All of us are to be praying. All of us. It's not just for the preacher to pray. It's for all of us to pray. All of us are to let our physical and our spiritual lives intersect so that the spiritual life has an impact on how I live my physical life. And all of us are to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wrote this to Timothy, but this letter was meant to be read to the churches in the area around Ephesus. This was meant to be read publicly. So while it was a private letter, it was meant to be read publicly, and that means it's applicable to us today as well. Prayer is the means by which we connect our lives to God, by which we connect our physical lives and our spiritual lives. Without this intersection, we will never become the disciples that we are meant to be. So let me ask you a question. Here's, here's the last thing I want you to, to think about here this morning. Which is more important to your life? Breathing in or breathing out? What? Breathing in? Oh, so then you can just stop breathing out. Right? I mean, breathing in is the most important thing, then you can just stop breathing out. You don't need to worry about breathing out. Just go ahead and take a deep breath, but I don't want you to breathe out, okay? For the, all of you that believe that breathing in is the most important part, just go ahead and take a deep breath, but then you're not allowed to breathe out because that's not important. Now, maybe you believe that breathing out is the most important part. Okay, fine. Then I want you to go ahead and empty your lungs, breathe all the air out of your lungs, but now you're not allowed to breathe in. Can you really say that either one of those is more important than the other? <laughs> Not if you want to live. <laughs> so let me give you the breathing in part of our spiritual life. It's found right here. Breathing in. Taking this into my life. See, if I don't take this into my life, then I'm not breathing in, spiritually speaking. Guess what prayer is? Breathing out. You don't take God's word in if you're not praying out. 
your spiritual life is dead. It can't be alive without both of those. And Paul here made the argument that prayer is so important to this. So here's the challenge for this week. If you do truly desire to develop a mature Christian spiritual life, then pray more. Pray more. Spend more time in prayer this week than you did last week. Spend more time in prayer today than you did yesterday. You, you want to grow a stronger Christian life? Pray more. You want to live a life that enables you to actually share Jesus Christ with someone else? Pray more. That's the formula. Pray longer. Pray for more people. And pray for God to use you. The name of Jesus is a powerful name. It's a wonderful name. It's a beautiful name. And we're meant to share it. For those of us that already know it, there's an assurance that we get because we know it. And we're going to close with this last song. Wellington's going to come up and lead us in prayer. And I just encourage you as, you, as we bring this service to a close, that you would consider how you know the name of Jesus and what it means to you, and how you can pray for more people this week. You can pray longer this week, and how you can pray for God to use you. Let us bow our heads. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this word that has set forth. As we gather our thoughts in our minds, as we, as we prepare ourselves for this last song, for the invitation, Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that you would continue to allow us to be more like you. Let our, our prayer life show those that we are a prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time. Those that are here and those that are watching, we ask, Lord, you, you would continue to bless them and up. We pray. Amen. Stand to your feet, if you will, <clears throat> as we sing this last song together.
thank you, Lord. You're good to us. We know you love us. And we just ask you, Father, that as we go from here, you will remind us again of our need to truly give ourselves to you, to pray more each and every day, to take in your word each and every day so that our spiritual and physical lives can intersect. And Lord, that it might do so where somebody needs to hear about Jesus. So give us this day, Lord, our strength that we need, the grace that we need, your presence in our lives in a powerful way as we go from here. And we'll give you the thanks and the honor and the glory and all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed this morning.